Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Stella. So today we're here to gather in conversation around design and leadership. And I'm going to pass things off to Greg in a moment to introduce our guests. But first, just to welcome you all to the space and cover some basics if you haven't been here before. Um, we're going to have a conversation for 50 to 60 minutes and then we'll open it up to Q&A. If you have any questions that come up, feel free to throw them in the chat as they arise. And when we pivot to q and I'll call on people. You can unmute and ask your question. This will be recorded for YouTube. So if you don't want to be on YouTube, just indicate that when you ask your question and I can read it aloud for you. And I will ask, if we can all turn our video cameras off, except for our guests for the day. And we can turn them back on when we start the Q&A. So I will pass things over to Greg. Okay, welcome uh, everyone to the store. It's great to be back again to uh, share some relationships that I have. Uh, uh, these are uh, two favorite people of mine who uh, I thought it would be great to bring together because of their background and their experience. And I think you will agree that uh, this is a very good pairing here at the STOA. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce someone that I actually went to junior high or intermediate school with, uh, Maria uh, Judice. She's a founder and organizational designer, and she's the author of Rise of the DEO, Leadership by Design, and is the founder of the experience design firm Hot Studio, which was bought by Facebook in 2013. I'm sure we'll be hearing about that. And then after leading design teams at Facebook and Autodesk, she now coaches leaders and teams to achieve their creative potential. And we also have joining us Lisa Norton, who I have known now for about four or five years. I'll maybe have a chance to say exactly how we met, but uh, Lisa is a transformative learning context designer working in several academic organizations, including the New School. And uh, she is actually a professor of design leadership at the Parsons School of Design at the New School. And she's prototyping the Uncertainty Lab, a group process for cultivating states of negative capability and design being a pattern language for designers and cultural influencers. So I'd like to welcome Maria and Lisa. You gotta unmute yourself, Lisa. Thank you, Greg. Glad to be here. So happy to be here in the STOA, my, one of my happy places. And I'm happy to be here too. And I'm glad that, uh, you know, it's, I'm just happy to be here with one of my childhood friends. <laughs> Absolutely. Why don't we start there? Goodness gracious. I was uh, my, my, with my mom, my sister and I, we were in Brooklyn. We moved to Staten Island where I went to um, Dreyfus IS-49. Uh, and uh, one of one of my chums was uh, Maria, uh, Maria Judice, who was from Staten Island. I mean, you are you are an Islander, right? Well, born in Brooklyn. Oh, so, like me. But, okay. Yeah, I was born in Brooklyn, but I was raised in Staten Island. And then, as soon as I can, as quickly as I can get out of Staten Island, I moved to uh, New York City to go to Cooper Union. Okay. All right. So, how in the world do you end up from Staten Island to Cooper Union? onto this great creative kind of pioneering career um, in design? Hmm. Well, you know, as you, you know, as you know, Greg, I've always been uh, an artist. You know, I started painting when I was, I don't know, eight years old. And uh, I, you know, so I thought that that was my path. My path was going to be fine art. Um, and uh, even when I got to college and I started taking design classes at Cooper Union, I was still pretty much in denial that I was not in fact a designer. 
But what I did love was lettering. I, I picked up a speedball book when I was a kid. I used to design band posters. Even the calligraphy that I did in college was very well designed, but I was still in denial that I was uh, not a, I wasn't a designer. It wasn't until actually my senior year of college when um, a guest speaker came into um, my class and he, his name was Richard Saul Werman. And um, uh, the fact that the reason why I was disillusioned, disillusioned uh, with design in the first place was because it felt to me that design seemed very formulaic. You pick a good font, you pick some white space, you get a nice image, slap it together, call it a day. That was like, that's why I was very much down on design. But when Richard came in and he spoke to us, it was like a life-changing experience. He walked in, sauntered into the, the, um, the classroom. He looked at all of us in the classroom and said, you are all full of shit. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and it, was, it was like what I needed to hear. It was like, design is not for you. This isn't, this isn't all about you. This isn't about like coming up with the best looking poster. Design is really about helping people make sense of the world. And that was the, that was the moment when it all made sense to me that actually design is about being in service to others. It's about helping people make sense of the world. And, um, and, that's, and that put me on a mission throughout the rest of my life. So, you know, I, I went to work for him right out of college uh, in New York City. He then opened an office in San Francisco at the dawn of the digital age where we redesigned yellow pages. I learned about the intersection of design and technology. I started freelancing, I got busy, I accidentally founded a company, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, so that was my path to design. Okay, well, we're going to have to talk about some of that blah, 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 because <laughs> that's pretty significant blah, blah, blah there. And one of the things that's so great is that the STOA is a place where people gather in order to engage in sense making, making sense of the world. So that's mm -hmm. perfect that you said that now. Mm -hmm. How about you, Lisa? How, and how did you end up being a professor of design leadership and, and someone who... Uh, thinks and sees through that, that lens and others. Um, and um, maybe go into talking about, well, I'll let you start there and then we'll talk about some of these uh, projects that you're, that you're engaged with and in. Great, yeah. Oh, there's so much, Maria, and what you just said that I relate to. I, my first thought is, you know, well, the first thought is redesigning the yellow pages. This is an intergenerational learning community. So what's, first of all, what's the yellow pages? <laughs> you know, it's such a, it, I so partly it's, this is a, maybe a Gen X or Generation Jones kind of conversation. So um, why don't you explain what the yellow pages are for these youngins who don't know? <laughs> Maria. <Yeah. laughs> okay, so the yellow pages, what, what, it's so, such an interesting problem to solve, right? Because back in the day, the, before the internet, the Yellow Pages was the only thing that connected people and communities together. It was something that everybody, everybody, every human being uh, who owned a house got a, uh, a Yellow Pages delivered to their doorstep uh, once a year. And it had um, basically phone numbers and community information. And so, and it was done on newsprint, yellow newsprint, thus the yellow pages. And uh, it was printed using black ink and, and red ink. And um, Richard was asked to rethink what the yellow pages could be for people in communities using very, very, you know, crude materials. And it was just, it was such a fascinating project to do, to rethink what what kind of information would benefit people and communities at the local level? Mm, okay, all right. So Lisa, continue. Such a great example of the power of design for sure. 
Um, yeah, I so I really relate to so much of your story, Maria. I also started out, I was a really creative kid and uh, we had one room and my parents were photographers. My, mm -hmm. I came, my grandfather was a photographer, so I had a really creative household. So there was a, a certain green lighting and we had a, a room in our home where anything could go. Mm which I, I think really contributed to the, me and my two siblings becoming creative in various mm. ways. Uh, I think everyone's creative, but I do the conditions afford it. You know, maybe we'll get into that hopefully mm -hmm. sooner than later, but just, you know, I'm, a, I'm an empiricist, I, I'm a maker. My roots are in everything I've ever learned has been by stumbling upon it through trial and error. So I'm very much an experiential and um, participatory and practical learner. So for me, art was one, it was sort of the get out of jail card. I thought, well, if I became an artist, then maybe I could guarantee that I wouldn't have to become some other professional role that uh, in my naive teenage sense seemed impossible but yeah i so in my trial and error i found myself in the mid 90s do well i i did a lot of work with craft traditional mm. craft especially metal smithing and so i really tacit knowledge has been the through line mm. And so that's the through line to my work today. I work with what's implicit and what can't be easily codified, we could say. Um, I think I'll leave it there. And, and uh, how did I get? So I found myself doing installation art in the mid 90s. And I was taking the uh, acoustic panels out of the ceiling, trying to create an analog for the autonomic nervous system. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. That's some of my, <laughs> blah. Uh, and I realized, oh shit, I can't get there from here. I can't mm. get there from the gallery. I wanna work with warm blooded human beings in real participatory context. And there, there wasn't that signaling, that call and response that I was beginning to understand I needed. Mm. I'll leave it there. Wow, you, you're leaving cliffhangers as well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how dare you, how dare you? So, so let's delve into some of these cliffhangers. Why don't we start with you, Maria? Tell us about your company. How did you stumble upon starting a company that ended up being, you know, acquired by Facebook in 2013? Yeah. Well, I always I think of everything as intentional and accidental at the same time, <laughs> right? Because it's like, uh, I, I mean, I I accidentally founded a company, but it, but the universe makes everything intentional. So it, it puts, you know, you got to put those two things together. And uh, so when I reflect back, one of the, I think, dreams I had when I was in college, I had this sort of fantasy of like being part of an, I guess I was calling it like an artist collective. I really wanted to be working with people that are highly creative that really want to solve problems uh you know on be behalf of people in society and i wanted that and i i kept thinking about like this i just want to be like in a collective like an artist commune um and i then i put that aside um and so uh, when i accidentally moved to san francisco to work on this yellow pages project um I fell in love with the technology, the intersection of design and technology. And um, I, I guess I just got very good at it. And while I was working at the Yellow Pages, um, because you know you were designing Yellow Pages for every like community in California and Nevada, it was like there were, we were pumping out a lot of Yellow Pages. Uh, it became sort of a machine. And I was in charge of cartography. So all the mapping systems for both states. 
and I needed to hire people to help me uh, build out the design system and actually deliver stuff on time, like, right, execute. So I was very young. I was like in my 20s, early 20s, and suddenly I became a creative director. I had like, you know, 20 people reporting to me where we were creating a design system for uh, using new technology for all of California and Nevada. And that's when I realized I had this superpower um, where I was very good at motivating and inspiring groups of people to, to achieve something like, a, you know, achieve a mission to a high degree of, of detail and quality. And I, ha I, was, I had this ability to get people to do those things. And uh, then I got to a place where I wasn't growing anymore. And I quit my job and traveled, went through, went to Asia for a couple of months, came back and I started freelancing and essentially just kept getting busy. And so I kept hiring people, my friends to help me. And then next thing you know, I actually had a company. So that's kind of how it happened. It happened through, you know, demand. And then, you know, once you have like 10 people who are looking at you, then you then you, then it, it, you know, the company starts changing based on the number of people you have and your leadership style has to change and evolve and the way you run a company changes. And over the course of 15, 20 years, the company grew to be a hundred people in two locations in uh, San Francisco and New York City. And uh, women owned. So it was, you know, not only, you know, it just had the qualities that it was like women owned 50% women, 50% men, I, as culturally diverse as I could make it work. So it had really these amazing qualities and culture. And between the quality, the culture, um, and the expertise, Facebook um, uh, acquired us in 2013, which was one of the largest design acquisitions that was done at the time by a tech company because this was a time when tech companies had an oh shit moment. This was a time when tech companies were like, oh, we were just like running, assuming that you know, people would use, use our services or buy our, our stuff because of the technology. And then there was this, this moment when they realized in order for them to be competitive in the market, we actually had to create products and services that people wanted and loved. And that required designers. <laughs> and so technologies had this awakening that they needed to have designers as quickly as possible, uh, you know, brought into their companies so that companies, uh, products and services could become a lot more human centered. And that was the impetus for Facebook. They had that oh shit moment where, um, and essentially the acquisition of Hot Studio doubled the amount of designers they had at the time from 50 to 100. Mm. So it was early days of Facebook. Okay. Yeah. So where does design thinking fit into, in, into this story? Because design thinking at some point became a thing. <laughs> okay. I'm curious what Lisa has to say about <laughs> design thinking uh, first, because I, I have like a very... I'm gonna leave you a cliffhanger about how, what I think about design thinking, but I'm gonna let Lisa answer that question first. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, I mean, all, you know, that was my, Greg and my conversation back and forth before, before this session was, you know, wow, the L word, leadership and design, the D word, these are just like <laughs> massively vast language. So it's good to get underneath that. And what do we really mean? What are we pointing to? Um, but yeah, design thinking was a thing. It totally was a thing. And Greg, you brought up IDEO who became, you know, the pretty much the global iconic consultancy in the sense that they really super codified the potential of design and then turned it into a global consulting um, yeah, I would call it, I would call IDEO a, the quintessential late modern, bridging modern into postmodern 
in a developmental sense, I might say that in terms of it. So it, it want IDEO, design thinking wanted to. Well, one second. Uh, I think Laura Cleveland needs to mute herself. Okay. And, and I also want to say, Lisa, that for people who are live on the call, they're saying, hmm, he didn't mention IDEO. What Lisa's alluding to is um, my last blog post on my blog, tuneintoleadership.com. Mm. Um, I, I, I wrote about this event and, and, and mentioned IDEO within that context. So for those of you who are not aware of Tune Into Leadership, whether you're live or recording, go to tuneintoleadership.com and subscribe for free. Okay, now I've done that little pitch. Please continue, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a really check it out. Uh, and I'd love to dig in. Maybe I'll make a bridge there. But yeah, okay. design thinking, Please. what was it? It was a thing. When, when, when did it come online? Like when did uh, design thinking become like a thing? Mm, I mm -hmm. could jump in on that a little bit. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I would say IDEO did a very good job coining the phrase about what design thinking means. And, um, but you know, you know, the, there's what it what it did for the industry was it allowed peop, uh, companies to understand uh, how they could bring in uh, essentially design strategy into their organization. But it was it was it's a tool. It's a series of tools and methods that that um, allow companies to think um, creatively using divergent convergent methodology. Um, and so I think IDEO did a really good job by coining the phrase design thinking and uh, creating sort of a revolution for companies, a curiosity for companies to embed design into their organizations. But my rant about it is you can't do design without doing. So, the the risk of design thinking is uh, it becomes sort of a checklist island. Oh, I oh I just I just did uh, I I bought post-it notes. I'm going to do some affinity clustering. Let, okay, now suddenly uh, you know it's design thinking. It it can get very um, um, formulaic. Formulaic. Thank you. Without really understanding sort of what the goal is, which is to get groups to for people to think creatively about problem solving. So uh, design thinking is nothing without design doing. So there's the thinking, but then there's the getting shit doneness of design that has to happen as well. Mm, I like that. I like that. Lisa, you wanna? Yeah, yeah and I think Marie's, Maria's comment gets at this idea that it, it's been nothing if not, un, not controversial design thinking. It, one way we could talk about it is as a, learning scaffold for business leaders as maria really was touching on it it brought the british design i think peter jones touched on this during his visit but um the british council developed the double diamond model that a lot of people in the audience are probably familiar with and then ideo really you know they really tricked it out and boiled it down you know that working with seduction that design does so well the seduction of we can take this wicked messy project and we can wrangle it into order so working with you know in the spaces between negotiating chaos and order is sort of one of the control practices that design is good at so it it was kind of a next step for uh, modern organizations that wanted to introduce, as Maria said, like convergent and divergent, we can make an object of what kind of a phase are we in in our process and it helps us locate ourselves. Okay, we're diverging now and then it creates some shared understanding, for example. It also introduced um, to like in a waterfall process and a managerial concept context, we might think of very linear waterfall fall type method, uh, but it introduced this notion of nonlinearity. I would say a modicum of nonlinearity. 
because it's still a very bounded rationality design thinking, but it introduced abductive logic into the mix with induction and deduction. And we, we really got that idea that, oh, wow, these creative designers, um, they're, they're paid to guess. Isn't that amazing? They're so when, when you say, when you say abductive, think, abductive thinking, which I think comes from Charles Sanders Peirce, uh, first great uh, pragmatist along with William James and, and John Dewey later. Um, so abductive thinking is basically hunches, like intuition, right? So, you know, um, that, that's an important part of it. So how does design thinking actuate or actualize that kind of mm. thinking, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm glad you, you brought up intuition because in my book, Rise of the DEO, I talk about uh, that it was a book that I it start it came out of uh, a talk a TED talk I gave in 2011, where I was really talking about seeing that I, I I made this sort of provocation that designers were going to be the next great CEOs because designers have been trained uh, in in a way in in ways in which they are uh, going to be the leadership qualities for the you know the next century. And the qualities that I called out were um, being a change agent, um, risk-taking, intuition, um, systems thinking, people-centeredness, and getting shit done. And so these are the things that you learn in design school, right? But if you apply them to leadership models, you're going to get a different type of leader, which proved out to be the case. Like we're seeing a lot more leaders, the qualities of, of new leaders that are coming in that we admire or have very different qualities than the leaders that we grew up with. But one of the qual characteristics is intuition. It's this ability to use the combination of analytics and intuition for decision-making. So, um, and so it's, you know, uh, old school leaders would not and a lot still today's leaders, a lot of them wouldn't make the, wouldn't make um, take risks without really solid data metrics to back up their decision. That might not get them the level of change that they need. At some point, they're going to have to uh, they're going to have to lean into what feels right. <laughs> and so, when you can can you can bring that combination of analytics and intuition and and trust intuition as a superpower, you are going to have a leader who's going to make, uh, enable big change to happen. Because mm. sometimes you're gonna need, to, I, I'm curious about the uncertainty lab, but part of being uncertain is trusting your intuition with the information that you have. That's so, that is so powerful. I'm so glad you said that because you, you took it right out of my mouth, uh, Maria, because I was saying that goes right to that uh, negative capability. Can you de define negative capability related to uncertainty and then the uncertainty lab? And then I'm gonna do a quick screen share to show an image from the book that uh, outlines these distinctions, CEO, DEO, what they share, and then traditional CEO trait and DEO traits. I wanna show that from actually uh, Monday's blog, but Lisa, please share with us. Yeah, I'm, the poet Keats, John Keats, originally coined that term, and I it has it does get thrown around quite a bit here in the Stoa. Um, it's a very important um, when we talk about the capacities we need to develop. It shows, I think, that we're um, humanity is still very much on a, le a steep learning curve. It's one of those emerging capacities that we can't. It is hard to define, so we grasp for, for these kind, this kind of language. But Keats originally defined it as the capability to abide with conditions of uncertainty, to remain, we might say in today's parlance, in the generative tension of the emerging future and the, in the present moment. So it has a lot to do with present aware, moment awareness, and there's we could probably 
say it's a whole family of interlocking capabilities that it's part of what we're doing in the uncertainty lab. I'll just say quickly how that happened um, because I can say it as a bridge in terms of I am right now in the process of joining the growing ranks of ex-academics or para-academics. I'm just getting ready to leave my position and it's partly to, um, you know, I've been look, I've been, you know, finding the others here in the STOA and in other rooms like this. And I think that we, um, we know from so many talks at the STOA that collective, we've known for decades, uh, we've had uh, an abundance of information, but we don't have the capacity to, to convert it to knowledge and wisdom. And we lack the capability to collectively sense and meaning make uh, in order to uh, coordinate decisions and actions. You know, that's really the, the sharp end of the spear right now. So I think that we purposely in the uncertainty lab, we don't have an agenda and we're, we know that, uh, for example, we recently had David Krakauer from the Santa Fe Institute come and speak with our students and faculty and he juxtaposes design in sharp contrast with complexity and emergence. And I think that's another thing that I'd really like to dig into. In a sense, designers work that messy middle territory and one good definition of a designer is um, a provisioner of choices. So with respect to the ethical landscape, some of the work that like Tristan Harris is doing, for example, just designers are right in the heat of that and we still don't have, we don't begin to have good principles or um, pattern recognition for how to even approach those problems. So maybe, maybe that's a segue into the image I, I think so. Um, I, I want to do a couple of riffs on that. Um, one of the things that comes to my mind when you talk about what the uncertainty lab is, is Nora Bateson's soft data model and the way that she brings people together uh, without a agenda that's, okay, we're coming to solve this problem. No, what we're actually creating is a generative space of dialogos. We are creating a space in which people can share about any number of topics and develop this growing emergence of collective intelligence that is like palpable. And that from that point of shared feeling, meaning um, and engagement, then you take a look at how do we solve such and such a problem? So I, I, I get that kind of sense from you when you talk about the uncertainty lab. When you talk about ne negative capability, the first time that I really, really honed in on that was the course that you and I took, Lisa, before we met <laughs> and knew that, you know, um, thriving in complexity, Meridian University with uh, Aftab Omer, the president of Meridian University and Zach Stein, known guest here. Yeah. And they talked about a set of capabilities to thrive in complexity. And the very first one was um, uh, Keats's uh, negative capability. So what I like to do now is show that image and then go back to Maria, because this is something that for, for me, Tune into leadership I mentioned is the blog that is powered by my company, the Jazz Leadership Project. And I've been on the store now, you know, hosting these, and I, I don't think I've had occasion to really even mention the Jazz Leadership Project. But when we're talking about design leadership, it ties in. And I gotta say, before I show this image, Maria, you know, I, I reached out to you after connecting on LinkedIn or reconnecting and getting your book and reading it, and it's like, 
I'm just shaking my head as I'm reading it. I'm like, oh my God, yes, yes, yes. You know, <laughs> just affirmation of a model of leadership that incorporates the analytical uh, and the creative, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, synthesizing together. All of these different dimensions that you deal with is what happens in jazz. And that's what we do to apply the leadership. So I wanna show this, um, this image so people can see and get an idea of uh, what we're talking about here. Can everyone see this? Can, they, can you see the title there? Design Leadership Maria? Yeah, we can oh, see okay, it. Okay, good, good, very good. Okay, so I'm gonna scroll up. This is, this is the blog post I mentioned. Now check this out, CEO, DEO. In the shared, you've got, they're both ambitious, confident, rational, and competitive, okay? And then look at the, look at the contrasts. Okay, give a couple. Authoritative, aspirational, linear systems, executes to plan, experiments and improvises, maintains stability and order, permits useful dis disruption, commands respect, earns respect. What a powerful distinction. Must be accurate, comfortable with ambiguity, and so on. So for me now, of course, there are CEOs who would say, hey, wait a second, I do that stuff too, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? And, 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 and one might say, well, yeah, because you've been influenced by design thinking and design leadership, baby, you know? Uh, <laughs> but uh, so Lisa, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Maria, mm -hmm. take off from where, where Lisa left off and let's dig even deeper into some of these, some of these topics. Some what, of the what? attributes that you see there? Is that, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so well, it you know, it's so interesting. It was remember this book, I, I had I came up with this idea in 2011. The book came out in 2013. So it's eight years in. And so now you can kind of look at those attributes and go, duh, right? But but at, you know, back then it was like, no, there, you know, it was does. Uh, leadership was still very much this sort of command and control um, perspective, right? Hierarchical, um, you know, focused strictly, don't make changes unless you can back it up with data. Um, you know, you know, and some of those other characteristics that you said about commanding respect versus earning respect, right? And you know, seven years ago, we got a whole new generation of, of people entering the workforce. Millennials, my daughter, what, I don't know, what's past millennials? Z, is there a Y? Yeah, I don't I think, I think Gen Z, I think. Gen yeah. Z, is it after the millennials? There's, some, there's another one in between, I think. But yeah. when I think about this new work, the, the younger people entering the workforce that have a much more global perspective, they are, they are demanding a different type of leader. And then now you have, you have the pandemic, which was a moment of a global disruption. Right. And in order for change to happen, oftentimes it requires almost a catastrophic event. Yeah. And so I call this the gift of COVID because yeah. it required people to adapt quickly to changing conditions that were uncertain. Mm -hmm. And you can see the, and, and, and there's a, a beautiful test case now, you can see those leaders that, that stood up and, and exhibited qualities that are new qualities that we're seeing, being courageous, being authentic, vulnerability. Like, you know, think about vulnerability 10 years ago, you wouldn't have a leader saying that vulnerability is a superpower. Mm -hmm. um, the human centeredness, the fact that it has to be uh, to the benefit of people, right. you had to be creative. Like everybody's born creative, everybody. Yeah. So they were able to have, they had to tap into that, that, um, that quality in order to come up with new idea generation and empathy, mm. right? You had to be empathy, emp empathic to humanity. So think right. about, you know, over the last 10 years, plus the pandemic, what we're seeing is a sea change of leaders 
that are stepping up uh, in this new world order that's globally connected and increasingly much more complicated. Um, and you know, wicked problems, they aren't, they, the old traditional CEOs can't work with wicked problems because they're not systems thinkers. It requires you to be thinking at global scale and understanding the implications of the system in order to make change happen at scale. And to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and with not knowing. And, and saying it out loud, mm. right? So that, you know, like, no, again, think about the leaders that everybody in this group admires from this period of time that we've experienced. Like we could see some of them, right? Like the, the prime minister of New Zealand, like there's, you know, there's um, Greta, uh, the climate change activist. There's these emerging pe people from, um, you know, uh, there's local groups that were, uh, were instrumental in getting um, um, people of color out to vote. There are like, there are these amazing models of leadership that we're seeing that have new qualities of, of leadership attributes that I'm really excited about. And that's yes. sort of the, I would say that's the evolution of the DEO. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of our clients, TD Bank, yesterday I interviewed the, um, the retail market president in, in New York and I asked him like, you know, what are some of the things that you all had to do during the pandemic? And he, I mean, banking, consumer banking is really conservative. I don't mean political conservative. I mean, just in this orientation, they you know, averse to risk. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to like, you know, make sure we, we, we not violate this and comply with that. And, and he was saying that, you know, there was, they didn't have a choice, as you mentioned, they had to pivot and there were certain innovations that came out of that, but their corporate culture was something that had to be there and in place and it was. And he told me that he says, you know, when you had Hurricane Sandy in New York, that's when like this purpose driven model became really, uh, it became enacted there because he says that, okay, our job is banking, but you have a hurricane and you got, we got people. So, our first priority is to the people and helping them. So they were giving out trees and doing, they had a daggone thing to do with, you know, their checking account, but they, mm -hmm. it was human centered. Mm -hmm. Again, back to design. So yep. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Lisa, you want to say something? Yeah, I would, I love the both end of that. You know, things are even in normal times, even pre COVID um, things were getting terribly worse and uh, horrifyingly worse and better than ever at the same time and we can hold that tension of uh so i the, what i would add on to that or, or complicate would be that the way i'm thinking of there was a um victor papanek was kind of the ralph nader of design yep. and criticism back right. in the day, like the 60s and he made the comment, or he wrote a famous piece that said, uh, it was about how design is, on the other hand, captured by the market uh, and instrumentalized, you know, and reduced in its um, potential efficacy and even its meaning in society. And that that's sort of my uh, key interest is, you know, the generator functions, the mechanisms by which that happens. But uh, the comment, I, the comment he made was the situ the profession of design is akin to if all the physicians in the world stopped general practice and just started practicing plastic surgery. Mm. And it's a great uh, image for it's a great analog for unfortunately, you know, design was the as a profession, design was the quintessentially modern form of creativity, you know, so the role of the designer and that's also, you know, really, this conversation has so much to do with role and how we perform and enact leadership and design what that could mean. So I would say that 
the 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 risk my concern would be uh, does the do these models leave the game a design game intact do they do they, do they um leave our modern and postmodern underlying assumptions untouched the assumption that we can know the system the assumption that we um can um drive change with design so i think a lot of that is really up for grabs and you see i think there is certainly um, meta modern moves that folks are making to try to to do that both and move of first of all how can design uh, what's the, like in Howard Bloom's sense of it, how does design contribute to the blooming, buzzing, uh, erotic opportunity that's here with us every moment? How is it a form of uh, action learning? Well, well, why don't we take that question, Maria, mm -hmm. and now that you are working with you know, executives and teams, how do you how are you applying that in your work with them now um applying what specifically can you be the, more specific the, the 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 can you repeat that kind of the last thing you said lisa because i, I wanted that to be a, a jumping yeah. off point mm, that i think that you know that the raw creativity the raw eros that we participate in like in aileen's comment here the uh from silos to combos how we how we riff yeah the transition that i I'm, I'm pretty confident that the jazz leadership project is tracking because we are we are coming with a really creative uh, model in yeah. some very um you know we're bringing a circular holistic model in some very mm -hmm. square spaces mm -hmm. i'll say mm -hmm. it like that yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at Aline's comment here as well. And so, I mean, now I, uh, you know, I left corporate America in 2018 after sort of an existential crisis. And, uh, and then I, uh, uh, I discovered what I really loved doing, which was motivating and inspiring people. So I, uh, became uh, an executive leadership coach. And so now I do work, I work with, I work with uh, leaders and teams um, to, you know, bring out, you know, to, to bring out the best in what they have to offer. Um, so it's not just around creativity. And, and in, in the context of design and business, there are certain companies that have more of an awareness about design than others. Uh, sort of a maturity and uh, there's still very few companies that are enlightened I call them enlightened that they understand design as a strategic um, asset but I also um, I also understand that words like design can be a loaded term where people really don't understand it so I often try to not lean on the word design I actually try to meet people, but try to understand the language that they're speaking yeah. and, and, and bring in that idea of that everybody's creative and bring in the way to, to get people to be much more sort of agile and flexible uh, uh, as Aline says in her chat box, but you know, how do you bring in sort of iteration and experimentation? How do you bring in people-centeredness and empathy? How do you bring in models of curiosity? So if you can kind of decouple what design means and you can bring in those qualities um, and get people to change the way they think and their perspective of looking at things, um, you can get pretty far. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, when people said, you know, when people try to like put design in like, oh, it's this thing here. I would say, well, let's not call it design. What do you want to call it? Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Meet the, meet, meet, meet your client where they are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and adopt their language. Yeah. 
where really they can bring important. in these qualities so that they can be thinking much more um, uh, iterative, more flexible, be more courageous in their risk taking, dependent on the industry. Um, all these things are, you know, just just divorce them from the word design, and then you got the money shot. Uh, so for those who are watching this later, uh, let me read because you can't see it. Those who are here can see it in the chat. Uh, Aline Frankfurt said to jump on what Lisa mentioned: design thinking as a way to navigate navigate, excuse me, between chaos and order. Jazz seems the perfect metaphor for leaders to move from command and control to focus and freedom that helps to move from silos to combos. Beautiful way of putting it. From rigid to agile organizations. That's so beautifully put. Now, since we mentioned vulnerability, mm -hmm. I'm going to put you all on the spot. Okay. Maria, you said you had an existential crisis, which mm -hmm. then prompted your transition. Yeah. Lisa, you are transitioning mm -hmm. from academia. I'm sure that there's something existential about that. Yes. So can you all please open up to us and share what, what that's about? Yeah. Um, Lisa, you want to go first? Jump in. You want me to go first? Sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I, I think I, I'm sure Lisa could relate to this. So, you know, uh, around 2018, I left Autodesk and um, I, I was, I had this, you know, I'm in my fifties, so I've had a long career and technology tech companies tech traditionally are not very kind to people, uh, older, older generations of people. And I was, you know, I, I went through this, like, who am I if I don't have this job title, if I'm not in the game, if I'm not making X number of, of dollars a year. And, and, and I started like going on, you know, recruiting calls. Um, but what I noticed was I, I was doing it because I thought I should based on who I am and where I've been instead of what I really wanted. And I just noticed I wasn't really caring about any of these jobs. <laughs> I was just like, it was not, it wasn't resonating. Um, and so then I went and it was all about ego. Uh, and, and, and I went, I went to a party and I encountered a colleague of mine, Clement Mock. And he said to me like very profoundly, sort of like a Richard Worman moment. He said, Maria, you have been working since you left college. You have not stopped working. You've raised two kids. You went from one thing to the other. Why don't you just stop? <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> and so uh, he said, why don't you just stop and give yourself some time to reflect? And so that was like a moment. I said, oh, what if I did stop? And then I picked up this book by William Bridges called Transitions. I highly recommend it for anybody who's going through this process. And what I discovered about transitions is the beginning of a transition is starts with an ending. It could be good news or bad news. It could be a good ending or a bad ending. But whenever something ends and think of COVID, COVID was an ending, uh, uh, you know, as we know it, uh, uh, what, what our past life was. Um, we go through a grieving process. It's just a natural part of the process. We go through all the stages of grief from anger all the way down to depression. We go through all, and we have to go through those stages. We have to grieve an ending. We have to grieve the thing that we're leaving behind. It's part of being a human being. But once you hit that bottom, there's a point where you hit the bottom and you, and uh, it's a point of reflection. And William Bridges calls it the neutral zone. And I like to refer to it as like lying in a casket above ground, waiting for your body to be like resurrected, <laughs> right? And you're stuck in this casket for as long as it takes. And it's, it's a point where you just have to get to where you kind of hit bottom and you have to think and you have to figure out what's next. But then you do, you do figure it out. And that is the point where the creativity takes over. This is the point where you, 
and, and pe there's a lot of data that talks about people in points of crisis, when they hit the bottom, that's when they feel the most creative. And mm. that's where the birth of new possibilities begin. Mm. So you hit the bottom and then new possibilities open up and then you have new beginnings and it's beautiful. And that's what happened to me. I hit the bottom and then I realized that what I love to do is inspire people. I'm going to take classes in coaching. I became certified and now I coach people and I love it. And it's sort of a new beginning for me um, and a new journey. And so Lisa, you're going to go through that stage mm. once you leave academia. So I'm going to pass the baton to you now. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Um, yeah, I just want to connect. You said so much there. I want to try to hit on a few things. I think one of the things we're learning right now in the design and creativity, in the um, civilization design space, let's say, is that uh, design. everyone is a designer. They just don't know it. And designing is a species behavior it's a, it's a form of niche construction so it's it i'm thinking of karen o'brien the climate scientist who has this wonderful project called you matter more than you think and it has to do with the imaginal and won't it be interesting a hundred years from now to look back at earthlings like us who, what are we not seeing right now? What, what's right hiding in plain sight? Um, so I think what design has not seen in the past is that it has been putting lipstick on the pig, you know? So that's one of the predicaments that, one of the developmental dilemmas that design, the double binds that design finds itself in. Um, so, and I said that because um, I think that when we, in this moment of distributing choice making to the most local sensors in the system, if you will, if we, what would it mean if everyone knew they were a designer? It just gives me goosebumps to think about that. What would it mean if we didn't, underestimate human beings and um you know what um use expertise and the professional roles in a way as a proxy for distributed human creativity so there's so much in that but yeah i shared a little bit of my story at the um meridian integral convergence but i, I will try to be very succinct and just say that, yeah, I, I just finished not too long ago reach, reading Mark Foreman's book called The Monster's Journey. And I, I know Greg featured that in one of your sessions here. But basically in brief, it takes Campbell's hero's journey, but it looks at that hero or heroine's journey through the lens of trauma, early childhood, adverse childhood experiences broadly. They use that ACEs model. And I, that's really, that's my real story is that I, um, my early trauma was such that I didn't, I was socialized to be acutely aware of my surroundings and to cue off my power, my getting my needs met meant being very other oriented. So paradoxically, my life has been organized around service as well. And I really relate to what Maria said about that. I, that's my deepest joy. That's how I, fill myself up and i think loretta and um I imani and, imani and tony yeah and tony really spoke yeah. to that thanks Greg. absolutely absolutely i think we're at the point where we can ask folks to unmute their video so they can join us on the screen and uh, margaret if you could i do see a lot I do see a lot of questions on ethics, so we should probably touch on that question. All right, we're going to let Margaret take the 
helm of helping us to choose. And there'll be some people who may want it read, some people who may want to come on. So um, feel free, Margaret, to. Uh... Sure. I think I missed the ethics comments or questions. So if anyone sees them, feel free to call it out or boost signal to stay in the chat. Um, well, Maria, maybe maybe Maria can can based on what you you recall seeing, you yeah. can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, first of all, Lisa brought up the Center for Humane Technology by Tristan Harris early on, which is a, a, a company that I almost worked for, but I, um, I did some volunteer work for them. Um, where they really, you know, they can't, they also produced social network, if you saw that movie, but uh, Tristan is, was really one of the early, early people to kind of really kind of start calling out these tech companies about um, is the, you know, are you creating uh, products for people or is the people the product? And uh, it, you know, bringing up a lot of questions around ethics and the designer's responsibility. Um, and, you know, absolutely uh, what has come out over the last 10 years. And, and I was at Facebook in the early days and I saw this, it was, you know, think of this. I was in Facebook, I was 50. The average age of Facebook was 25 years old. The CEO was 25 years old. So you're creating this global platform <clears throat> designed by 20, 20 year old kids who aren't really thinking about the negative implications of the technology that they're developing. They're way too optimistic. They're not looking at negative actors. They're not looking at uh, unintended consequences. And so a lot of this technology has been developed by young people who really didn't have a view of the world that there were a lot of bad people. And um, now uh, it's it has become even more apparent that uh, if you are designing you have, a, and you are in service to your people, you have an obliga obligation to be designing um, for the betterment of humanity. And if you are in a situation where that company is not focusing on improving people's lives, then you have, you're at a choice. You're at a choice. You can choose to not work for that company you can choose other avenues to call out bad actors, but um, ethics plays a big, big part in um, the role and responsibilities around designing products and services for people at scale across the world. Okay, Margaret, and and, by, and while when you come on, Margaret, I've got to go get my charger for my computer so I don't get cut off. So <laughs> I'll be right back. Margaret, okay. you going to? Yeah, okay. thanks for thank the heads you. up, Greg. Okay, thank um, you. Evan McMullen, would you like to ask your question? Sure, yeah, let me, uh, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, let, let me uh, scroll back up to it. So, so yeah, my question is along the lines of ethics. Um, and so, you know, you guys, I think earlier, someone described design as, among other things, uh, being sort of the art of enabling choices for people. And so the flip side of this is that design also constrains choices um, and not necessarily hard constraints, but also soft constraints. So, you know, million, millions of people will have their minds settle into and adapt to the grooves of processes where some options or decisions in the process are easy to find and others are hard to find um, with which ones are which determined usually by designers. Um, and so it seems that design all too often is done in the service of the interests of the creators of a product, its corporate owners, rather than the users of a product. So I'm curious about your thoughts about the ethical obligations of design professionals given this context. Now you did just say that, you know, you have a choice here to make in roughly that same context. So maybe we zoom in a little bit more for this question and say, um, you know, I, I think, it's kind of unfair to ask individual professionals to put their careers on the line to, you know, I'm not going to work for company X because, well, kind of all companies are like that. So I'm curious if you have thoughts perhaps about like collective action on the part of designers, similarly to the way that other professions like say medicine has a code, which is enforced by a sort of professional guild structure um, that prevents hopefully too much unethical practice from happening in the medical field. And I'm not aware of any similar universal type uh, group for designers. So do you have thoughts perhaps on, on that? 
Um, do you want to take that, Lisa, or do you want me to? Jump in. I, I have okay. a, I can make a quick response. Yeah, yeah. Um, I assume that you're familiar with Mike Montero's Ruined by Design book. <laughs> <laughs> who uh, who uh, really talks about, who used to work for me, by the way. He, he was an early employee of Hot Studio. Um, and he really talks about this idea of, of designers like uh, unionizing, collective action. And, and, and there have been a lot of um, movements to, um, to create sort of a, um, to create some sort of um, commitment from designers. I, IDEO was actually doing this as well, um, where designers would kind of sign this pledge, this almost like do no harm pledge. And I mean, but there's nothing that has been like designed at scale. First of all, I think it's really an impossible task because you're talking, you know, design, this so many different flavors of design, right? And and I also want to disagree that not all pro, not all companies are the same. That there are companies that are trying to do the right thing, and then there are companies that are that are not adopting, adapting. And um, when more um, more diversity happens at product companies, and there's a big, there's been a huge DEI push for diversity and pro in products. And I, and I was a champion of that early, early on in the Facebook days when, you know, I looked around and it was like a bunch of just white boys designing global products. Um, so you're seeing more and more pushes for a more diverse population of people who can design products that are more sympathetic, empathetic uh, to local culture. Um, so there's there's a lot of really good work being done, Evan, but there's no one giant sort of union um, that can can create sort of a collective action for designers. The good news is that the conversations are being done um, and and they're teaching ethics in schools now. Um, and designers are learning as part of their process to be designing um, uh, uh, based on negative actors, which wasn't done in design school before. So there's a lot of progress that's happening, but at the end of the day, designers have to work for companies that are, um, are, are consistent with their own cultural um, attributes. Uh, this is such a rich topic. I'll just throw in a few things. Um, yes, I see some comments in the chat about Cheryl Heller. And I think the, mm -hmm. the way that design followed all the trends that we've seen in the innovation space over the last several, several years. So there was there were several equivalent, like the the Do Good Pledge was one of them and right. like in the mid 90s. Um, and there was the equivalent of like Designers Without Borders. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had, you know, the um, precautionary design and engineering movements come in and also uh, the effective altruism uh, movement around, you know, checking our empathy and whether it is bias in disguise and what checking our assumptions and intentions so doing a lot more deep ethnography work and and self-reflexive questioning I, I would Kevin Deland had a question in here about what are some of the moves and I if I'm not mistaken it was Kevin but the idea of I think it all comes back to learning uh the heuristic they use at the santa fe institute and there are, i think every discipline probably has its word for this but um how do we design things that get better over time one one word for that is agathonic design that builds a relationship that actually deepens and matures that that um leverages um our needs and desires uh, and our acculturation to hypernormal stimuli for better outcomes. So the distinction between, um, it's sometimes called uh, competitive or complementary 
artifacts and technology? Are they uh, the Weinsteins have talked a lot about this, for example, does the, does the artifact or system um, uh, rob me of my capacity or is it actually a, a learning scaffold? And uh, just one more quick comment I'll make about um, in Jamie Wheel's book, he gets into this and there's a great book called um, Order Without Design and another great book called Strategy Without Design that's playing in these tensions of how do, how do the, the affordances and constraints of design f help us find that sweet spot of our learning where we're not hijacked, but we're actually entrained into focal practices. Mm, that's wow, that's powerful. I just wanna say very quick that in our model, our Jazz Leadership Project model, we have a principle called antagonistic cooperation, which is an orientation to challenge and conflict. It actually derives from the hero's journey that where instead of looking at those conflicts or challenges or difficulties or intentions as negative, you view it as an opportunity to learn and grow. And I'm telling you, out of all of the principles and practices that we talk about, that antagonistic cooperation seems to really connect with people in the, in the workforce and in corporate America, very strongly. I wanna ask, uh, before we continue with, the, with your questions, um, participants, I wanna ask Lisa and Maria this question that is in the description of the event. How has, or oh, has being a woman, no, no, how has being a woman helped at times and or hurt at times in your career? <laughs> how much time you got, right? You probably say, how much time you got? <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I grew up as a tomboy. Uh, yeah, I remember. I remember those jeans you used to wear, boy. Yeah, yeah, I grew up as a tomboy. <laughs> so I always was sort of like, I am equal to you. I'm equal even better than you. So I, but I, I recognized as a as a woman that I wasn't I was not necessarily going to be treated equally unless I stepped up to the plate and declared that I'm equal. And uh, so I, I I don't know I had that sixth sense early on, and then you know running my own company, I was one of the few women owned businesses in the Bay Area. Very few. Um, women uh, CEOs in design um, and you know uh, definitely saw I think the benefit of being a woman is that I bring a unique perspective to culture and I had a I had more you know of an eye on diversity and and gender equity and and I, I was very I I had a uh, I allowed my um I allowed my employees to bring their babies to work. We had a babies at work program. Like I was saying, if you could bring dogs to work, you could bring babies to work. So, you know, I did a lot of those programs through the sensibility of being a woman. Um, but I also saw a lot of um, times where I was not, uh, I was taken for granted because I was a woman. And, um, you know, in certain, you know, I would go on pitches and I can see that I was not going to be, uh, you know, viewed uh, as seriously as my competitors. Um, but you know, like you said, Greg, it, these are the gifts too. Like in adversity, there's a lot to learn, and there's a and and I, I just look at adversity as uh, new design problems that have to be solved. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Okay, Lisa. Hmm, yeah, interesting question. I think for me, actually due to my um, my own unique life circumstances, I identify, I find that I identify more with my generation mm. being like between the boomer and um, Gen X. I know what you mean. Gen Y. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would just a quick anecdote from back in the 90s when I was uh, a practicing artist, I was identifying as a practicing artist. 
like I say, I had this interest, my primary interest was in craft and the craft tradition. And of course, hindsight is twenty twenty, and now I, now I realize that I was interested in what Loretta was talking about, the how culture is transferred across the generation, how, cult, how the living rooms that keep culture alive. But at the time I was doing things like putting the quilts back on the bed and putting, I was interested in experiential ways of knowing and what craft practices could teach us about being, uh, ways of being, modes of being. So, and I got a lot of criticism from women, uh, the generation before me, feminists in the generation before me. I'd, I'd love to hear Raven riff on this, but basically to the effect of, look, kid, I spent my whole year, my, I spent my whole life getting that quilt on the wall to be admired as a work of art. And here you are, like basically defiling it, putting it back on the bed, putting it back into uh, the lived experiential realm. So that was definitely a tension. And I would just add that um, due to my trauma, due to, due to the fact that um, I didn't ever identify as someone who has experienced trauma until much later in hindsight, but um, I identified myself as other, as an alien. So I always identified with the other. So the, the psycho, you know, a lot of the psycho and demographic category identifications have never meant that much to me. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, that clarification and that framing. Okay, Margaret, are there any others that we should be bringing up in the, in the yeah. 10 minutes we have left? Sure, um, I'd like to invite Natalia uh, to say their question if they're interested. They had a couple. Well, I don't know if the question is necessarily welcome because it's a bit of taking the quilt out uh, from the wall and putting it into lived experience. But I was really curious about the power dynamics when it comes to design and the ideal and the ethics of everyone being um, able to design for their future and design for their spaces. And yet in practice, um, having to work within the constraints of what the client expects an actor within the whole system. So how do designers um, navigate that, that tension? Mm. Mm. Natalija, let me just jump in and say, I totally love that question. I think that is, you know, you're really putting your finger on something and it's another one of these generative tensions. Uh, Jamie Wheel, again, I would come back to that analogy just because it's fresh in my mind. I re just, re like, recapture the rapture. Recapture the rapture. He's talking about kind of, he's talking about signals and, you know, signals and cues, uh, feedback cues are so, are everything in doing uh, an, a situational assessment about the design landscape we're working in. We have to understand how to read those signals. So yeah, I think Jamie's comment was that almost in an Austrian economics, can we do Austrian economics, you know, 4.0, where we decentralize autonomously uh, the, the responsibility that comes with creativity to local actors. And I think there's a lot of movements like pluriversal design that are more about entanglement and indigeneity in relation to um, assemblies of actors and more than human actors. Mm, okay. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is um, this is it's not a, this what you're bringing up is not necessarily a design problem. It's a change making problem. And uh, and so when you're thinking about like creating change at scale. And in this case, you're talking about designing things for the future. Um, you do have to get a you have to you have to actually do a lot of design work. You have to look at the you have to kind of kind of define what the system is Do, what does what is the current system like what's the current system how is it connected where are the problems where are the gaps right 
You got to look at the people who are stakeholders in that system and you got to understand their positions, right? In terms of how willing are they to cross over an edge to make change happen. And then you have to look at what you're trying to accomplish and you're trying to look, you have to look at what they're trying to accomplish and to try to craft a strategy where you can create a shared goals, a shared vision. Um, and, uh, and then figure out how you can move the needle of change incrementally. Um, unless of course it's a crisis, which everybody then has a shared goal, which is, oh shit, we have to, we have to make change happen. So it's really about engaging, really understanding the pe people, where they are in the process, how, uh, how they're resistant or, or how enthusiastic they are to change and looking for shared goals and shared vision to get everybody on board to make change happen. That's, that's and, very... and, and it, takes, it takes multiple years for it to happen. Mm. You know, if you are a change maker, this is a long game. Mm. So expect three to five years to get mm. change to happen. Yeah, that's experience talking there, you know? I mean, one of the things in my, in my leadership studies, like, like the, lit the leadership literature review to prepare to run my company is this great book, The Practice of Adaptive Leadership. So adaptive leadership, the technical versus adaptive. Technical is like, okay, we could follow the same rules and do the same things to solve this problem. Adaptive leadership is like, oh my goodness, this is a totally different complex thing here. And it takes time and it's going, and, and it's going to be hurt and loss involved and you have to manage all of that. So yeah, now we're getting into some of the nitty gritty of the reality of, of organizational uh, and, and leadership and team change. So that's really powerful. Well, and it's kind of connected to what you're saying about jazz and, and somebody said about going from silos to combos. Yeah. You know, you can't do anything without really connecting to people, meeting them where, they're all, where they are and having yes. them participate in the process in the way exactly. that they need to. Exactly. So they can take ownership of it. Yes. And be a yes. part of it. And mm -hmm. if they are the, whether it's politics or in a company, this is adaptive leadership again. I love that model. If in a battle or a contest, somebody loses, you have to acknowledge their loss and thank them for their sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Imagine if that happens socially. Okay. Right. So, Margaret. Yeah, I'm actually going to ask a question of my own. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is, See if I can tie some threads together. So Lisa, early on, you mentioned something around when you were moving away from installations about needing that call and response from warm-blooded humans and that signal. And that sounds, it tied in with me for what, what you guys talked about in terms of intuition and also what I'm hearing now with what Maria just shared about like finding a common goal and that resonance with other people. And I'm curious, to hear how either of you, how you access or like what your relationship is with your own intuition and how you hone that and grow that as a skill, as well as um, using the jazz metaphor, um, like how do you invite that in other people? You know, I think there's that, I wanna say Louis Armstrong quote of like, if you have to ask, you'll never know about <laughs> jazz. And you know, like you meet some people who literally don't get jazz, so it's just like, okay, what's happening here? So for people who really, you're speaking a foreign language or not even a language that they know is a language, how do you kind of bridge that gap? I'm just gonna say through feelings, we all have feelings. You tap into mm -hmm. people's feeling zone and feeling mm -hmm. tones and yeah. you go from there. Mm -hmm. Well, from a coaching perspective, if I was put on my coaching hat. All right. <laughs> right? There are basically three levels of incent. There's three centers of intelligence in our body. There's the head center of intelligence, the heart center of intelligence, and the intuition, the gut, the body center of intelligence. And we all have them in, 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 in gradations, but some people work 
uh, aren't in touch with e either center of intelligence. Even though they have them, it might be a very low self-awareness. So some people can't get out of their head. Some people can't get out of their heart. And some people are just highly, um, just do things are action, gut instinct, action center, right? And part of coaching, what I do is I help people identify where they're, where they're, where they're, um, they're overusing one center and underusing another. And I help them figure out how to make decisions by dropping into different centers of intelligence in their body to connect them to either their emotions, their action centers, or even their thinking center. So recognizing people where they are and, and appreciate the empathy, really understanding where people are, what edges they, how, how resistant are they to cross edges? And how do you bring them along to, to introduce them to superpowers that they, they have as human beings, but they're not using? Yeah, I would add to that, to what Maria just said, just to say that in general, I think, you know, we're, we have a paucity of uh, models for ways of being and roles. I think that's one of the things that really trips us up. So where we have like in collective uh, presencing, I think that's one of the things that Rhea is really getting at. Um, we the recombinant possibilities that M Maria just referenced, whether it's head, heart, hara, or there's all these different models for how to engage the different uh, thinking and feeling and acting uh, modes. But uh, of course, that's a reduction. We're, we're just trying to figure this out, right? We're at the very beginning, I think, of a multi-generational, multi-decade project to apprehend that's so much what the uncertainty lab is about is it's not uncertainty isn't a destination but it's a step along the way to being able to grapple in such a way that we can find a truer certainty a more beautiful certainty a more beautiful certainty i think that's a pretty good place for us to to close out, that's beautiful. So I wanna thank you, Lisa Norton, and thank you, Maria Judis. Thank Margaret for facilitating the way she did. And uh, just, you know, it's been, it's been, uh, it warms my horror, my heart and my head. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and just, uh, it's just been a pleasure. And what I like to do now is just uh, let's go with some music. Hopefully you got that music. Uh...